Okay, so, uh, yeah, my name is Gonzalo Casas. I'm, I'm a software engineer <laughs> working in, a, in Gramatio Color Research, which is a chair of architecture and digital fabrication at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich. And our, our team has more than 10 years of experience in, in robotic fabrication an intensive track record in different uh, robotic processes, different systems, uh, different materials, and in everything ranging from like model scales to full-scale architectural projects. And through this applied research, we're, we're ultimately aiming at uh, affecting the building industry and perhaps redefining the role of architects building architects in this case, in the future. Um, most of the work we do involves industrial robots, but we use them in very different ways compared to the automation industry. We, we use them to create precise customization, so to, to enable designs that are in which every element is different from the other, um, different in their position, in their orientation, in their geometry or any combination of that. And these designs would not be possible uh, otherwise or would be prohibitively expensive. Uh, in our research, we investigate additive and manufacturing. We investigate formative processes as well and substractive, substractive processes. And uh, one of the things we observe is that the, the paradigm of architectural design is, is very likely going to change significantly in the coming years. There is a, there's a new wave of architects. This one actually shocked me when I started working there. Uh, this, these architects are not actually drawing geometry anymore, not in paper, but also not in CAD. They are coding geometry. They are writing Python data models that represent geometry. And they use that to create parametric models that generate infinite variations. So to support this new paradigm, we, we are building a tool called Compass, and in particular a package called Compass Fab for robotic digital fabrication. Uh, Compass Fab is, a, is open source. It's MIT licensed, so it's compatible with commercial, um, commercial um, approaches. It's, based, it's, it's written in Python, and the main aim of the framework is to ease collaboration and research in, in the architecture, engineering, and digital fabrication industries. To put things into perspective, Compass is a kind of an ecosystem of Python packages that provides interfaces to backends, and this is where ROS comes in. One of the packages, in the case of robotics, one of the backends that we use is uh, ROS. Um, and then on the other side of the equation, there are frontends, and th those can be CADs like Rhinoceros or, or Blender or basically anything. But at its core, the library is just a standalone Python library. So you can do geometry processing with it from the Python uh, interpreter. Uh, it's completely CAD agnostic, so you can just do that. But that's not very useful, so um, there are some standalone viewers in the library. But um, most importantly, this is how we really work. The library can be used from the scripting engines of CAD software. So this is Rhino on Mac, which is one of the tools we use most often. Um, there's also uh, the possibility to use from that, uh, that from Blender. And in terms of um, robotic fabrication, the, the, um, the library provides three main areas. Or the, the main goal is to ease planning and execution of industrial trajectories. Uh, and we do that by leveraging the advances in the field of robotics that exist in the open source. We, we're not reinventing anything. We're just interfacing it to make it available for, a, for an audience that would otherwise not have access to it. Uh, so the three main areas that Compass Fab brings in is like fundamentals uh, that doesn't need much explanation. It's just a shared vocabulary, a way of basic building blocks for robotics. 
robot models, which is heavily based on URDF from ROS, and it's basically an in-memory representation of robots that matches what, what ROS and ROS Industrial does. So there we, we greatly benefit from the fact that ROS Industrial community is providing lots of support packages for lots of robots. And then uh, there are backends, which is what I want to focus on a little bit. But before, uh, as a quick example of code, um, this is, we have a few different ways of loading support packages from like ROS and I. This is one that we find kind of easy to get started because a lot of people don't have, like, I'll explain a little bit later why, but um, most of these people don't have ROS running. So to get, to get to a point where they can see the robot, uh, this is a one, like a shortcut into the thing. Because the, the support packages are so conventionally structured, uh, we have a GitHub package mesh loader directly in the framework that can just pull the thing. And as I mentioned, here we see side by side a comparison of code, Python code, for Rhino and for Blender, and the code is essentially the same. The, the only difference is that we import the component that takes care of the visualization from a different package, but then the thing results in the robot being visualized in, in the different CADs. And the thing I want to highlight today is how we use the ROS backend. So this is the way we actually use ROS Industrial in our daily workflow. Uh, <clears throat> that's a window of, of uh, Rhino running on Windows. Uh, we rarely see Arvis in the daily work. We work inside CAD environments. We script the usage of all this tooling directly from the scripting engine of these things, just invoking ROS services and ROS topics. And what we have here is the, an integration with Movit specifically where we were calculating two Cartesian plans, one for picking up a brick, the other one for placing it, one free space uh, motion to, to go from the picking station to the placing station, uh, placing location, and then all the um, uh, planning scene manipulations, adding objects, adding bricks to the, to the wall, removing it, attaching it to the road, and so on. Now, um, one of, the, one of the issues that we have is that this is not a Linux tool, definitely. It's not a Linux user base to begin with. And I know that many tutorials of ROS begin with, okay, this is how you use the terminal, and this is Linux. Uh, but we don't want to do that. We want to use ROS as a service. And what we do is we put it inside Docker containers. So we, we set up... Um, basically cells, robot cells, in Docker containers. So we, we turn the relatively involved ROS setup into one command or one right click for the, for the user that can say, okay, I download this Docker Compose YAML file, let's say Compose app, and that's it. The, um, the overview of all the moving parts is kind of like this. So on the lower layer, we, we have the end user and what they see, uh, which is a, a Windows or Mac uh, computer running a CAD like Rhino. It uses the Compass Fab to, to call um, ROS, which in turn use, uses ROSLibPy, which is a library that we, we released about two years ago, also in open source. Uh, not to be confused with ROSPy, ROSLibPy is the ROSLibJS equivalent for Python, the, the library that, that talks to the ROS bridge, uh, from ROS bridge suite, suite. And then inside the Docker layers, we, have, we just have a bunch of ROS nodes, the ROS master, depending on the robot type, we, have, we might have a driver or not. Some, some drivers are not just don't work inside Docker, but some others do. Uh, we have the bridge because the communication is over WebSockets, and then we have Movit running kind of headless 
and then the communication to the robot. So the next few slides are intentionally boring. They show that it's actually easy, very easy, to the point that it's boring to call all the kinematics and planning functions of MoveIt from this library. Uh, this is an example of how to do forward kinematics. You create a configuration and you say robot forward kinematics of that configuration and you will get a frame. Uh, you'll see the line that does client load robot is the thing that pulls everything from ROS. Inverse kinematics is almost identical, just that you pass the, the frame and an init configuration and you get the configuration back. The, uh, it's important to notice that these are full examples. The, everything, you know, these are not slight examples. You can copy paste them and they run. Um, even the imports are included. This is an example for planning Cartesian motion. Uh, a little bit more code, just takes a list of frames and a bunch of other arguments that I'm just ignoring here, but you can tweak this, of course. Um, and then for free space or kinematic motion planning, uh, you, you pass the constraints, the call constraints, and you get the plan. So that's it. I think I'm already above, uh, over the time. But uh, um, this is more or less our daily screen. That thing on the, on the right is Grasshopper, this parametric tool. Um, if you are interested, I'll be around. I can show you a quick demo for this. And yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gonzalo. Um, other questions? From the audience, yes, hi. Hi. Hey. Um, I was wondering, now that you've made the deployment so easy, what is it that your colleagues, students, I don't know, have most difficulty with? Are there still things that you would need to solve for them? Um, yeah, the, the, there are there are plenty of things that we want to solve. Uh, in particular, for the things I showed, the Cartesian planner that is by default in Movid is uh, would need some help for our, for our usage. So we're looking into using different uh, Cartesian planners like uh, the CAD or Tesseract <coughs> or something like that. Um, a slightly higher level complexity is that even though all these building blocks are easy to compose, it's still relatively hard to do sequence planning for these sort of problems. So deciding, deciding on the sequence of an assembly is a pretty intricate problem. And there are some solutions around, but nothing that still, nothing that we're super happy with yet. Are there further questions? No? Then, uh, Gonzalo, thank you very much. Thank you.